Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, unless there are any qu initial questions, I'm going to just start talking about, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about immateriality of the soul, which was uh, book one, part four, section five, that I didn't get to at the end last time. So, and, you know, uh, there's a lot, actually, of really interesting things in that section, um, but I don't feel like I have time to talk about almost any of them, or I just want to read the summary of the conclusions about the, about the soul. Um, so... Right, this is book one, part four, section five, paragraph 33. To pronounce then the final decision upon the whole, the question concerning the substance of the soul is absolutely unintelligible. Right, so the real question that people want to ask here is, um, what is the soul itself? Is it an extended thing or not? Is it a body or not? And Hume says the whole concept of a substance doesn't make sense. <laughs> so there is no answer to that question. Um, so then he answers some other questions that are kind of close to it. Um, but the questions that are close to it are... I mean, although interesting things come, really interesting things come up in his discussion of them, the, the questions themselves, when you see the answers, you realize they're not really very important questions. Right? So here's the answers to the other questions that he thinks do make sense. All our perceptions are not susceptible of a local union, either with what is extended or unextended. There being some of them of one kind and some of the other. So what he means by that is, um, and you know, it's developed at great length in the section that um, if you ask, like, could this perception be in the same place as a body, right? Can it have a local union with something extended? The answer is, well, if it's the perception of something extended, like a visible or tangible impression or idea, then yes, because even according to the philosophical view, so according to the vulgar view, an extended impression is a body, right? Like when I see the pen, what I see is the body. So I don't see something that represents the body. I see the body. So my impression is the body. That's the vulgar view. The philosophical view is that there's my impression and then there's the body that's the cause of my impression or whatever. And they're not the same thing, but they resemble each other. So, and again, you know, uh, Hume understands this the way he does in part two of book four, quite literally. The, the uh, idea of or impression of something extended resembles that thing because it's extended. So, um, or at least there's really two things here that, that Hume sometimes distinguishes carefully in this part, but but maybe not as often as would be nice that um, there's having actual extension, meaning having parts that are next to each other, that are in that kind of order, whatever that is. And then there's being like having a position in that order with respect to other things. So, like, 
a simple idea or impression doesn't have the first of those. It's not extended because it only has one part, but it has the second. It's It can be put next to other... A simple visible or tangible impression can be put next to other ones. So, right, and so that's how, like, in other, so even if my impression of a grain of sand is simple and the grain of sand itself is extended, it has many parts, um, the way the impression of the grain of sand resembles the grain of sand includes the fact that they both have a position in a spatial order with respect to other things. So therefore, the grain of sand could be in the same place as a simple, as, sorry, the idea of the grain of sand could be in the same place as a simple part of a grain of sand, because they're both in places. Right. So, um, whereas Hume says, as opposed to passions, um, pains and pleasures also, apparently, uh, smells, tastes, sounds, um, all of those Hume says don't really have, uh, that is, their parts aren't ordered in that way, or they can't be put in that kind of order. Right, so you can't take smells and arrange them in a circle or feelings of anger or whatever. Um, so, so they can't be in the same place as a body because they're not in a place. Or as he says, uh, although it sounds strange, many things that exist are nowhere, including some of our, our impressions and ideas. So it's, uh, I mean, again, there's a lot of interesting questions. How do we know that? How do we know that only visible and tangible ideas have that property? And is that empirical or what's going on there? But in any case, um, but as far as the question goes, once you see that that's the answer, like, is the soul something that's capable of being in a place that could be united with a body in place? The answer is, well, the soul is a bunch of perceptions and ideas, and some of them are in places with respect to each other, and so they could be united with things that are in places with respect to each other, and others are not, and so they couldn't. And that's the, that's the answer. And, you know, then so what depends on that? Nothing, Hume says, right? Like, there isn't any... Hume says there isn't any like religious or ethical issue that depends on this. Um, and then I guess the final part of this, um, and as the constant conjunction of objects constitutes the very essence of cause and effect, matter and motion may often be regarded as the causes of thought as far as we have any notion of that relation. Right? This is his answer to a mechanist type of argument that says, look, how could the motions of bodies ever give rise to perception? Um, which, like, I mean, either can be used as an argument that they don't or that they do, but it's inconceivable how. That's Locke's position. Right? But um, one way or the other, right, as opposed to Spinoza and Leibniz who conclude that they don't bodies don't cause perceptions. Um, but um, Hume says, you know, so that's based on the rationalist type thought that we understand what bodies can do and what they can't. And remember, Locke agrees with that to the extent that he thinks we see a necessary connection between solidity and motion by impulse. Um, but Hume doesn't believe in those necessary connections. So Hume says, we don't have any, any idea in advance what bodies can or cannot do. The only way we know what effects they have is by seeing what's constantly conjoined with them. And if, you know, every time bodies move, I get a certain impression, then that's what we mean by saying the bodies cause the impression. End of story. So again, it turns out, like, the answer is so to speak, anti-dualist or, you know, um, like anti some strong distinction between body and soul, but it's not because, um, 
uh, Hume is establishing some important new principle about how bodies can change souls, it's because he doesn't think we understand the connection between anything and anything. <laughs> so therefore, we also don't understand the connection between bodies and souls. Uh, um, what else is new, right? <laughs> um, we don't understand how bodies move bodies either. Um, that is, or I think more precisely, like we don't know what that question means. Um, right, as Hume says, I forget if this is in the treatise of the Enquiry. He says this is especially in, I, oh, it's in the treatise. It's in this week's reading in, in part seven. He says, you know, it's particularly embarrassing to the human ambitions of like what we really, really want to know is what causes everything. Where, what is the secret power that moves everything? And it turns out that not only don't we know the answer, but we, but even our desire to know the answer comes into question because we don't know what it is we want. <laughs> right? We, we just, we don't, we think there's another question. I think maybe is the best way to put it. We have a feeling that there's an, we have a tendency to feel that there's another question that's not answered when you say, well, this is what always happens after this so far. So I kind of expect it again. We, we think there's another question, but like, why does it happen always after that? But Hume says, we don't really know another question. Um, so again, and it's kind of tricky or, or, funny you know so again like this can't possibly be damaging to religion because um what this shows is that like you couldn't prove anything important by considerations about cause and effect one way or the other <laughs> so um um so uh, it wouldn't have made a difference to religion one way or the other um, okay, that's all I wanted to say about section five before I get on to the new material. Are there questions about that? Okay, so the, the new material is these two sections. Section six is about personal identity, and then section seven is conclusion of the first book of the treatise. So conclusion of the book of the treatise that's about the understanding. Um, so um, I'll just talk about each of those in order. Um, so personal identity. Um, So, uh, you know, in this section, Hume goes again into his idea about identity in general um, in a little bit more detail, but I already explained that last time, so I'm not going to say too much about that, except that um, you remember that Hume thinks there's such a thing as, it's a little bit, more complicated than this. I was going to say, Hume thinks there's such a thing as strict or absolute identity. That is ab strict, absolute sameness. So where Locke apparently, again, this isn't completely clear about Locke, but where Locke apparently thinks that when you ask, is this the same as this? You always have to add in, is this the same something as this, right? Is this the same oak tree as this? So identity is always relative to a certain way of treating things that are actually different, and they're different because they're, at, they're, they're certainly different because they're at different times. So uh, like um, identity is a way of treating things that are different as the same for certain purposes. Of course, it's the, the big oak tree is not the same as the little sapling. Uh, and even if it hadn't grown, the oak tree at one time isn't the same as an oak tree at another time. 
Um, if it was the same, there would only be one thing and there'd be nothing to talk about here. Rather, it's like we treat it as the same for certain purposes, and that's identity. That was Locke's theory of identity. But Hume thinks that, no, there's something we have in mind when we say that something is the same. And sometimes that situation actually occurs. And then other times, like in the case of the oak tree, the situation doesn't occur. But we're misled into thinking it occurs, so we, we mistake certain other relations for identity. So in a way, they don't disagree, Locke and Hume, in a way, don't disagree about what we're doing with the oak tree. It's just that Locke says that doing that is just using our correct idea of identity, whereas Hume says doing that is pretending there's an identity where there isn't one. Um, so where is there an identity, according to Hume? And again, it's this case where, um, and like, it's, it's hard to draw this. I mean, so like, I want to draw the time axis and then mark things out on it, but oops. I keep thinking someday I'll get these plugs ironed out, but maybe not, because maybe Zoom teaching is almost over. <laughs> maybe I'll never get them ironed out. There we go. All right. So I want to draw a time axis and start marking things on it, but Hume's whole point is that it's like part of the um, fiction that's involved in inventing the relation of identity is thinking that there's one time axis for everything. And that, so that, you know, if A is simultaneous with B, and B is simultaneous with C, then A is simultaneous with C. Because this time axis, you know, divides the whole plane into lines. And each line is the class of things that occurred at that time. But Hume thinks this isn't really the way time, this is, this is a fiction. That act, so actually, our idea of time is an idea of things succeeding each other changes. One thing succeeding a different thing. So there always are impressions and ideas or perceptions succeeding each other in our mind. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes something doesn't change. So if something doesn't change, when we just focus on that, we, there's no changes in it, so we can't associate different parts of the process with different times or something. There is no process. If this were our only idea or impression, we would have no idea of time at all. Right? We have an idea of time because, well, first of all, because this doesn't, and that's going to get us to the point here, this actually never lasts forever. It always ends you know, eventually, but, uh, but even while this is lasting, we have other ideas and impressions always that are changing. So really all of these are simultaneous with this, right? And that's why that simultaneity, that like transitive property of simultaneity that I was talking about before doesn't really hold for Hume, right? Like this, call this A and this C and this B. A is simultaneous with B, and C is simultaneous with B, but A is not simultaneous with C. C happens after A. So Hume says, but by a fiction, we kind of, the imagination kind of separates out B into different pieces. One is simultaneous with A, one with C, etc., 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 these are all really the same thing considered as being at the same time as something else, right? So it's really just B considered as at the same time as A, considered, but we think of them as different things. 
And then we think, oh, but they're related. They're related to each other. How are they related to each other? Well, I mean, they're related to each other by not being different things, <laughs> by being the same thing, and that's the imaginary relation of identity. Okay, so um, I know that's probably I still that's not focused. I know that's probably still not very clear. Are there questions about that? It's, it's one of the more interesting ideas in Hume, and also it's one of the more interesting disagreements between Hume and Locke. So it would be great if you understood it, but if you don't have any questions, you can't answer them. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so, um, so now when we turn to personal identity, the, question, the first question Hume is going to have is, is there really identity or not? Right? As opposed to in Locke, the question Locke was going to have is, okay, for what purposes do we treat two different things, things at different times, as the same person? Um, but Hume's question is, first of all, is, is there really the same thing or not? And his answer is, so, 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 so first of all, in order for there to be the same thing, what would that mean? It would mean that, um, well, actually, no, let me not, let me, let me read this first and then explain how it's related to that. This is the beginning of uh, section six. Section 6, paragraph 1, on page 164. There are some philosophers who imagine we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self, that we feel its existence and its continuous in existence, and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration both of its perfect identity and simplicity. So those are philosophers who think uh, the answer to that question, is there some, really something that's the same, is yes, there's something that's the same. It has perfect identity and simplicity, right? Simplicity means that at any given time, it doesn't have different parts. It's just one thing. Um, so, um, So it's not actually clear which philosophers he says has in mind when he says this here. It's not Locke, at least not as I understand Locke. It's possible he understands Locke differently. It's certainly not Locke's view of personal identity. Yeah, so I mean, it's right. Um, I mean, Locke does say, remember, that we have intuitive knowledge of our own existence. But um, um, he, he doesn't say we have intuitive knowledge of our own identity, perfect identity and simplicity. Um, right? On the contrary, again, Locke says, um, well, again, I think Locke says there's no such thing as perfect identity. <laughs> right? That is, Locke thinks it's really the case that there can't be the same thing simultaneous with this and with this. But then when this change happened, even though this didn't change, there were st still two different phases of it that were different from each other because they were at different times. And so even if there was no change in myself, but of course Locke doesn't think that either, right? Locke thinks that my idea, Locke agrees with you that my ideas are constantly changing. But even if they, even if they, quote-unquote, weren't changing, they would still be different from each other. The ones at different times would be different from each other. So we couldn't have an intuitive knowledge of their perfect identity because they don't have perfect identity, and there's no such thing as perfect identity, according to Locke. So Hume isn't thinking... I, I'm pretty sure Hume isn't thinking about Locke here. He might be thinking about Descartes, 
Descartes does think we know for sure that we exist and that uh, we have perfect identity and a certain kind of simplicity, at least. Although it may not, it's not exactly what Hume means by simplicity here, perhaps. But anyway, um, uh, but if he is thinking about Descartes, I don't think that's the right interpretation of Descartes because um, Descartes doesn't think that we know about that identity and simplicity because we feel it. Descartes not an empiricist at all. He doesn't think that the things we know come from the fact that we feel them. <laughs> He thinks that uh, we know because it, we are involved in a contradiction if we try to deny it. So, um, um, right? There's if we try to, if I try to doubt that I am one simple thing that's identical in all my appearance, in in all my ideas. Um, Descartes thinks that I'll find that that doubt is contradictory and I can't entertain it. So, um, so Hume either is interpreting Descartes differently than me or also possible, even likely, he's giving Descartes an interpretation that he thinks makes sense. So he's arguing with the closest thing to what Descartes says that, that makes any sense to him, which is what philosophers often do. Um, oh, this is a question here. Would you be able to give a, another clarifying example? Which, this was like six minutes ago. I'm sorry, I just noticed it now. Another clarifying example of what? Identity, according to Locke, according to Hume. Of identity, according to Hume. Right, so I mean, I can give an example. I don't know how clarifying it is, is the problem. I mean, actually, one example I always think of when I read this section is this uh, episode of Beavis and Butthead called Amination Sucks. And their teacher is like, they're going to do a class animation project or whatever. And so their teacher is going on and on about how like magic animation is. Um, and how, uh, you know, because it can make pictures move and etc. But meanwhile, what you see is a still shot of Beavis and Butthead just going like, <laughs> that nothing changes. <laughs> right. So, um, the, um, so whatever, it's a complicated joke about, of the, you know, of the animator about themselves or, you know, whatever. But in any case, <laughs> um, they, when you, when you think of that, so like, how does Locke understand that versus how does Hume understand that? So the way Locke understands it, so, you know, you can, uh, you can think of these two lines here as like the video and the audio tracks. <laughs> in the video track, there's nothing but a still shot of Beavis and Butthead. Whereas in the audio track, there's, you know, the teacher is saying all this stuff. So, like, the way um, Locke understands that is the way a video editor would represent it to you, right? Where if you zoomed in enough, you would see the same little picture of Beavis and Butthead over and over again be identical but repeated for each different time in the audio track. I'm not sure those lines are right, but so but Hume would say what the video editor is doing is the same is it's it's presenting it to us in a way that makes sense to us because it follows the same fiction that our imagination follows, basically. Namely, that there's more than one picture corresponding to these different sounds, where in fact there's just one picture. Right, whereas Locke thinks the video editor is right. That no matter, even if these pictures are absolutely identical, there's one at one time, and there's another at the next time, and there's another at the next time, and so on and so forth. <laughs>
Hume thinks, no, the video editor is, it, like our imagination, is engaged in a fiction here. And what really should show on the video track is just this one still picture. And it goes with all these different sounds. So, um, okay, so that's, I don't know if that's an example or a metaphor or something for Hume's view of identity versus Locke's view of identity. But then you can see, because, so after it says besides the oak tree, so you can see how, like, um, so from Locke's point of view, now if you turn around and say, okay, suppose the pictures are not absolutely identical. Right, suppose we take a normal scene where the animator's actually doing something instead of just um, giving you the same picture of Beavis and Butthead, right? So the Beavis and Butthead are like moving in these pictures and for every change in the sound, say, there's, a, there's actually a change in the picture. Um, but then, you know, so if you say, if you ask, well, so is it, does it really continue to be a picture of the same two characters or not? So Locke will say, well, of course, these pictures are always different from each other, even in the case where they're, where they're I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't use the words identical because that's from identity, right? Same, but even where they precisely resemble each other, they're always different from each other. They're not identical. They're not the same picture. One is a picture at one time and the other is a picture at another time. So, um, and you know, and, but we treat them as if they were all one picture because they exactly resemble each other. If that's what we're counting as the same in this case. So when we go to the case where the characters are moving around, you're like, um, Locke will say, well, okay, again, the pictures aren't really the same. There's more than one of them, so they're different. Um, but you can treat them as the same for certain purposes, as long as you're clear about why you're doing it. And well, as long as it has the right properties of identity, I, I won't get into that, but like, um, you know, like you can't have a being identical to B and B being identical to C, but A not being identical to C. You have to you have to be careful about what relations you use here or whatever. But assuming that you know we don't have problems like with that here, Locke is gonna say, fine, you know, those pictures all have a certain resemblance to each other and they have a certain sequence. Um um, and it's a sequence that's right for a certain purpose, right? We're per portraying a certain action of Beavis and Butthead or whatever, and all these pictures contribute to it. And so Locke will say, yeah, that's identity. That's just a different standard of identity. Whereas Hume will say, because Hume said that in the first place where the picture's not changing, Hume said, here there really is identity. It's the same picture. The only kind of mistake or fiction or confusion is to think that that identity is a relation between something and something else, because it's really, there's really only just one thing, right? But, um, um, but there really is only just one thing in the case where the picture is not changing. Now we go to the case where the picture is changing, and Hume will say, well, um, they're not the same now. So in this case, it's just a mistake to say that they're identical. Why do we tend to think they're identical? Well, there's, a, there's these other relations between them. Resemblance, cause and effect, purpose, whatever, um, which I guess also is somehow related to cause and effect. Um, and we mistake those for identity. Because when we remember this sequence, it's easy for the mind to pass along and it's almost as if we're just re remembering one thing. We mistake this for identity. And so Hume, looking at the same relationships that Locke will say constitute the identity, right? The reason it's, it's the same, it's pictures of the same character is because of these relations. Hume will say, those relations are what we mistake for identity.
we think it's pictures of the same two characters. We call it pictures of the same, the same picture in some sense, um, uh, because there's these relations and we confuse them with identity. Is that, I don't know if that example was clearer than the oak tree or not. I hope maybe bringing in the video editor helped if, if you've used a video editor. <laughs> but if you were from my kid's generation, I would know for sure you use a video editor because they're like on TikTok every second. But I don't know whether you guys are part of that generation or not. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So now, so getting back to the question of personal identity. So, um, so the person Hume is arguing against is someone who thinks that there really is personal identity, but they agree with Hume about what identity is and what our idea of identity is and how we can know that there's an identity somewhere. Um, so, um, so what would it mean that I have... Uh, immediate knowledge of myself as something perfectly identical and simple, it would mean that there's some impression that's always the same. Right? Other impressions and ideas might be changing, but there's this impression of myself that never changes. So Hume says, well, we can see from experience that there's no such thing. Um, I mean, it's actually a little more complicated than that. Hume says, we, we can see from experience that we have no such idea as self because it would have to be copied from an impression like this, and there's no such impression. Um, um, I think... I think he's saying that more with a, you know, an eye towards issues that are come, going to come up on the more correct view. I mean, if this were really true, we wouldn't need to form an idea of this impression. We wouldn't need to form a copy of it because it would always be there. Right? So, um, uh, but in any case, so, but, you know, but he says, from what idea could this impression be derived? It would have, sorry, from what impression could this idea be derived? It would have to be an impression that's always there. And then he says, um, um, well, uh, there isn't such an impression. Right, so this is in the second paragraph. This is the step he takes in the second paragraph of section six. Um, if any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives, since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there is no impression constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passions, etc., etc., never all exist at the same time, blah, blah, blah. Right? So just, you know, um, this is an empirical point. Um, I mean, it's, it's a kind of weird empirical point in the sense that um, since... Uh, if, if I can say now that there has not been such a constant impression throughout my whole life, then the question is answered. I don't, right? I don't have to worry about the future being like the past. Um, so in a way it's, I mean, there's still a question about how I can trust my memory or whatever, but, um, in a way this is more certain than the usual empirical conclusions. 
Um, I mean, that shows actually like how weird the question is. Uh, um, maybe it's not surprising because it's a question about myself. It's a question about that that is centered on the current time where whenever the question is asked. So it never has reference to future time. All right, I'm not sure if you understood what I was just worried about there or not, but I thought it's interesting. Anyway, um, so uh, so be it as it may, I think you know. Although Hume is a little unclear, or at least. I've been confused over the years about what he's saying here. I think I understand now, but you know, but so, but the point is that like this, that there is no such impression is empirical. That is, there would be no contradiction in there being such an impression. It's not absurd that there's an impression that's always there. After all, sometimes one impression continues while the others change, right? Like in the Beavis and Butthead example. So uh, why couldn't one continue always while all the others changed? Um, there's nothing absurd about that. Um, it's, I mean, Hume does seem to have some further questions that I won't get into about. So, okay, well, even so, how would all the other impressions and ideas be connected to that one that continues? Such that I could say that they all inhere in it, or they're all its impressions or ideas. Um, but in any case, uh, I mean, I, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to use that argument for much because he just, he says there just is no such. I mean, cause I mean, like you can imagine answers to that. I mean, Hume himself thinks that passions, um, are like about other ideas or impressions. It's in some strong way. It seems like every idea and impression could be about this one or something like that. But anyway, like I said, he says, there is no such thing, right? I have different impressions. Some last longer than others, etc. But there's no one that continues all the time. And therefore, there's nothing that could be the impression of myself as a supposedly perfectly identical and simple thing. Um, so, um, so the thing that's confusing is that he says um, at the beginning of that paragraph, from what impression could this idea be derived? This question tis impossible to answer without a manifest contradiction and absurdity. Right, so somewhere there's a contradiction or absurdity here. But I think, like I said, the absurdity doesn't come in if if the metaphysician. If, I don't know. Maybe he does understand. Anyway, if the metaphysician really wants to claim that there is this impression that continues all the time, Hume. Oh, sorry, I didn't switch back to the blackboard. If the metaphysician really wants to to claim that there is this impression that continues all the time throughout my whole life, um, Hume actually says, "Well, uh, okay, maybe you have one, <laughs> right? I don't. I mean, he doesn't seem. Uh, he seems kind of sarcastic about that." Right, because it, like the next sentence after that is something like, but apart from some metaphysicians of this type, I may be confident that the rest of mankind doesn't have this thing, right? So in other words, he doesn't really believe that other people are so different from him that they have some, you know, like, what would it be like a certain note that you hear, like a sound that you hear throughout your whole life or like a thing that you, you know, spot that you see throughout your whole life or something like that. Um, it's always the same. So, you know, Hume says, no, people don't have that. Come on. <laughs> but 
on the other hand, it is true that if someone really digs their heels in and, and says, yeah, yes, I do, then Hume can't refute them. So where does the contradiction and absurdity come in? I think the contradiction and absurdity comes once we admit that there is no such thing as this. So now we admit that all there is is this, you know, sequence of impressions and ideas. Um, so, um, you know, so what is myself? What am I talking about when I talk about myself? I mean, I guess, you know, the common sense view might be I'm talking about my body. Um, and in a way, that's going to actually be Kant's answer to this question. Uh, that there, Yeah, there is nothing permanent in inner sense, but something permanent is given to the senses, the external senses. But that also depends on other disagreements he has with Hume uh, to to make that out. But in any case, so, um, but I guess Hume takes it for granted, at least in this context, that when I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about my, my mind. Um, oh, wait, here's another question. Does that mean that impressions have to repeat eventually? Why would re impressions have to repeat? Oh, in order for there to be personal identity. No, I mean, repeating isn't going to help. Uh, right? I mean, like, you know, if, if by repeat you mean, so first of all, if, you, if by repeat you mean that the exact same thing is going to be here as was here, so again, that's something that Hume thinks isn't, absurd because it could be that it continued while it wasn't in my mind or something like that. Um, but that's not going to help with my personal identity, right? Because while it wasn't in my mind, it wasn't me, <laughs> you know? So there isn't something that was me this whole time. So even if it literally repeats, right? Like, I mean, clearly if you just, by repeat, you just mean there's something exactly resembling this, then um, that's not going to help. Those are not the same thing. They just resemble each other. But even if you, you, you engage in that fiction that the vulgar engage in about our impressions and say, no, this thing persisted the whole time. It wasn't part of my mind while it persisted. Right? That's why the vulgar formed this view that our impressions are distinct from our mind and independent of it at least our external ones. So, um, so there still wasn't something that was me this whole time. So that's not going to help with personal identity. I guess by repeat, you also could mean that there's like an eternal recurrence and we get back to this time again or something. But even that, that still won't help. Because I wasn't the same in between, right? Like if there's an eternal recurrence of the same, and I, eventually this impression will come back again, meaning because time will get back there again. Still, I wasn't the same in here. So yeah, I don't think repeating is going to help. But okay, so so anyway, this is the. Um, so if all there is is this, and again, assuming that when I talk about myself, I'm talking about my mind. Um, then when I talk about myself, all I can be talking about is this kind of like jumble of impressions. It's, well, it's not just a jumble. I mean, it's, it's in order somehow. But, uh, but nevertheless, Hume, you know, you remember before Hume said the mind is like a heap of impressions and ideas. A heap is the classical example of a whole whose parts are completely separate or independent from each other. Um...
They just happen to be all in the same area right now, but they don't have any necessary connection to each other. And that's what the mind is like. It's just a bunch of ideas and impressions. And now, so, so now we can start understanding why we distinguish between the impression and the idea. So this is the impression from which the idea of self has to be derived. That's another, right, I just said, that's what I'm thinking about or talking about when I think or talk about myself. What that means is, that's the impression that my idea of self is supposed to be a copy of. Right, so like, when I think about this tree, it means, I have an idea that's supposed to be a copy of this impression, this tree impression here that I had before. Okay, there's another question. Doesn't there need to be something that is the subject of perception that is infected by impressions, awareness? Right, so that's what Hume is denying. But he's trying to explain why we think there is something like that. And remember, I mean, Barclay said there does have to be but Barclay also, at that point, said that the, the words he was using didn't stand for ideas. So the disagreement with Hume is kind of complicated here, right, if we wanted to compare him to Barclay. Um, right, so Barclay said that thing that I'm talking about that's a subject of ideas is not itself an idea or like any idea. So, I, so he would agree with Hume that I have no idea of self. <laughs> Um, okay, but in any case, so right, so so getting back to Hume, so the idea of myself is an idea that's supposed to be a copy of this big disordered impression of like different impressions and ideas. Um, and if the idea of myself contains simplicity and identity, then. Um, I'm, obs I'm involved in a contradiction because there is no simplicity in identity. There's no identity because they keep changing and there's no simplicity because again, like if we add in the other tracks, there isn't just one thing going on. There's like a whole bunch of different things going on at any given time. So, um, so that's the contradiction, and it's very similar, it's the same as the contradiction that Hume thinks we get into when we regard the oak tree as one thing. And it ha so, right, when, when we think of the sapling and the big oak tree as the same, they're not the same, obviously, one is big and one is small, etc. But we think of them as the same because there's a gradual transition from one to the other. And moreover, not only is there a gradual transition, but there's kind of cause and effect relation here and this kind of relation of purpose, right? Like we think at least, we at least think of the oak tree as kind of like trying to grow and stay alive and, the, and for that purpose, sucking water up out of the soil and so forth, right? Um, so, uh, um, so there's a strong relation between these phases and the change is gradual. So when we, when we look at any particular part, we, ba we barely notice it. So the, the mind remembering this, the whole sequence of the growth of this oak tree passes from one end to the other very easily. Almost as easily as if it were just remembering one picture one tree. And so we start thinking there is just one tree. We start thinking this tree is identical to this tree. But then we're involved in a contradiction because when we stop and look at the two ends, we see they're not the same at all. So we want to. So there's one. There's there's a case, there's a case where we want to say two things are the same, but we they're also evidently not the same. And that's the that's the contradiction that Hume thinks we get into here, 
awesome, right? We, for whatever reason, and I haven't explained this yet, but for whatever reason, um, we have the same tendency to regard all of these impressions and ideas as the same, both in this time dimension and in this dimension of different channels or whatever. We have a strong tendency to regard them as all the same, um, but, and you know, that's the sense in which the idea of self includes simplicity and identity. But on the other hand, when we actually look at them and compare one to another, we see that they're, they're obviously not the same, and so it's a contradiction. And then Hume says that just as in the oak tree case, the ancient philosophers invented this thing called a substance, Right, where they say, well, the, the quality and quantity of this thing changed. Its accidents changed. Um, but the substance remained the same. Just in the, as in the simple case I talked about last time, where Socrates changes color, but it's still Socrates. Right? The substance, Socrates, remained the same, but if one accident was replaced with another one, that's the ancient philosophy. And similar to say about the oak tree, there was one substance that lasted this whole time. As, you know, quay substance, so far forth as it is a substance, it didn't change at all. It's absolute identity. And it's also simple, at least in some sense, absolute simplicity. But meanwhile, it's so in this case, it's a lot more than just its color changed, right? Its shape and size and color and everything changed, but it's still the same substance. So, and Hume said, yeah, that's the kind of fiction the imagination tends to invent when it gets into this kind of contradiction. There's a very strong tendency that leads us into the contradiction, but contradictions also make us uneasy. So once we notice the contradiction, we're not happy, we don't like that. And so the imagination comes to the rescue by inventing some fictional entity that will um, take one half of the contradiction and separate it from the other, basically. Right, so now when we say, these things are all the same, and someone says, but look, they're totally different. We can say, oh, yeah, you have to distinguish between the substance and the accidents. When I say it's the same, I mean it's the substance. But um, what is the substance? As Locke already said, we, it's something we know not what. <laughs> right? It's, it doesn't have a size or color or shape because those can all change and it can be the same substance. For example... So, yeah, we don't know what it is. It's unintelligible. And similarly, Hume says in this case, um, 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 in order to justify, oops, in order to justify to ourselves this absurdity, so again, the absurdity is think at the same time thinking that there's just one thing, and it, it, but also noticing that it's, there's actually a whole bunch of different things. That's the absurdity. So in order to justify to ourselves this absurdity, we often feign some new and unintelligible principle that connects the objects together and prevents their interruption or variation. And in this case, we call that object a soul or self. So that's the idea of personal identity. The idea of personal identity is a, an unintelligible, it's the identity of an unintelligible fiction that we invented to get ourselves out of this contradiction. Or 
I'm not sure whether to say that's personal identity or personal identity is 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 like what the idea of personal identity is what generates the contradiction, and then to resolve it, we invent, uh, you know, uh, this unintelligible, continuing, substantial self. Um, So again, it's going to be pretty similar to the cases that we've seen before, the way this gets worked out. Like, I mean, well, so, so the question is, like, in this case, what leads us to suppose this identity? We explained why it is in the case of the oak tree. What makes us suppose this identity in the case of the self? And, you know, in the body of the treatise, as opposed to the appendix, which I'm going to talk about in a second, Seems to, seems to think it's pretty straightforward. So, like, here we are, here, and we have memory of part of the sequence before that, right? This, these are supposed to be kind of like the same as these here. So we have, we have a memory of this. So these are the ideas of our own previous ideas and impressions. Um, the mind passes easily along this series because although they don't, there isn't exact resemblance in this case, although there is often a lot of resemblance, right? Like our mind doesn't often completely change from one instant to the next. Um, so uh, there isn't, but there isn't exact resemblance, but there are plenty of relations that hold throughout this series. It's, it's not random, it's regular, and those regularities are the kind of things that make us believe there's cause and effect. So, um, so we keep, see cause and effect relations and relations of resemblance between these things. So the mind passes easily through the series when it thinks about it. And since it passes easily through it, just as it would pass easily if through, so to speak, that is, it wouldn't have to pass at all if there was just one thing, one idea here that I was remembering. I get these two confused and I start to think that there's just one idea here. Um, so it's pretty similar to what happens with respect to our belief both to the beliefs of the ancient philosophers and more fundamentally to our belief in the continued existence of external objects. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a pretty similar explanation. Um, however, there's also supposed to be a difference. Um, Um, where does he say this? I didn't write this down. Well, I don't know. I didn't write down. I know he says it again in the appendix. But anyway, there's, there's supposed to be this difference, namely that um, in the case of the external world, Hume says, we end up, when we think about it carefully enough, in a situation where uh, um, there's like an unavoidable paradox or incoherence. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, um, so there's no way of replacing the mistaken view with the correct view. And you remember how that worked out with the ancient philosophy and the modern philosophy and the view of the vulgar and, um, um, and I guess the just view, namely that there is no, are no continuing and um, distinct external objects is one that we just can't believe. Whereas he says in the intellectual world, this is what he says in the body of the treatise, in the intellectual world it's different. 
I can point out the error and then I can resolve it and there won't be any contradictions left. I can just tell you from now on you should realize that there isn't a continuing self, it's just a heap of impressions and ideas. Um, why that is, he doesn't say exactly. Um, and in the appendix, he take, that's what he takes back. He says, uh, I'm afraid that there's irresolvable paradoxes in the intellectual world as well. But here in the body, he doesn't say exactly why there's that difference. But I guess the difference is supposed to be because, at least in this case, there's no temptation to um, think that the self continues when it's not perceived. Um, so in the case of external sense, like the, you know, the case of the table or the oak tree or whatever, I just can't believe that it's gone when I close my eyes and then, um, and then what I see after is something completely different. The principles of the imagination are so strong. I have to believe that those are the same thing somehow. And, but any way I try to do that leads me into falsehood, unintelligibility, contradiction, or whatever. Whereas in this case, you know, there's no such thing as closing your eye and not seeing yourself. <laughs> and thinking you're thinking you're still there. <laughs> right? So, um, um, although, I mean, of course, in a way, there is in the sense that there's big parts of our life that we don't remember, not to mention when we're asleep, when we think we still exist, but you know, it's the times we don't remember, so like we don't have this idea of the, the keep during that part because we don't remember it. Um, but we still think it was there. Um, but anyway, so I'm not sure I understand exactly why, but I, but I think it's somehow related to that, that he thinks that in this case we actually can settle down into this philosophically correct view. Um, however, there is what he says in the appendix. So, um, right in the appendix, he, he says that after finishing the book, he, you know, as far as I know, the appendix was published with the first edition. It's strange that I've never tried, never figured out actually whether that's true after all these years. Um, but still, he must have um, Talk to people about the book, or at least thought over about the book. So, so he says that you know, after he wrote the book, he had um, he realized that there were some unclarities and so forth. But there was only one really big mistake, and this is the mistake. I had entertained some hopes that, however deficient our theory of the intellectual world might be. It would be free from those contradictions and absurdities which seem to attend every explication that human reason can give of the material world. But upon a more strict review of the section concerning personal identity, which is the section we've just been talking about, um, I find myself involved in such a labyrinth that I must confess I neither know how to correct my former opinions nor how to render them consistent. And then his reaction to this is interesting. If this be not a good general reason for skepticism, it's at least a sufficient one um, for me to entertain a diffidence and modesty in all my decisions. Right? So, I mean, so for Hume, the fact that this problem turns up here is not necessarily such a bad thing. 
and talk about the, the conclusion of the book, which I better get to soon because I want to time to talk about it. We'll see. I mean, he's ambivalent about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It depends what mood he's in or something. But anyway, like, uh, you know, this kind of setting a limit to human reason where we say, yeah, we can think about this matter to a certain extent and identify some errors uh, that we fall into and whatever, but um, but we can't think it through all the way to the bottom because we just end up contradicting ourselves. Um, we can't and we, and we won't, right? I mean, we won't actually try um, because it will become unnatural and strained and we won't be able to maintain it. So, um, so again, so from Hume's point of view, I don't know if this is a big problem. I think that for someone who feels differently about skepticism and um, about what philosophy should deliver to us and th things like that, someone like Kant, um, this would look like a glaring admission of, of defeat on Hume's part. Whether Kant is actually reacting to this or not is, uh, uh, I think, difficult historical question. He, you know, he probably didn't read the treatise, but he knew some things about what was in the treatise. Anyway, it's complicated. But, uh, but he certainly could, if he, if he knew that Hume arrived at this point, he certainly would say, aha, you know, Okay, here's a symptom of what's really going wrong here because he can't end up here. So, um, so like leaving Kant aside, at least well, I'll come back to it a little bit in a second. But, um, well, actually, I guess I'll come to it back to it right away. In when I say, so okay, so something went wrong, and he ended up in, in a paradox, a inconsistency. Anyway, what went wrong? Well, unfortunately, what he says in the appendix is very brief. And it's not so clear exactly what went wrong. What went wrong? Um, I used to always think, and I think I was I was thinking that this is what it would have to be to if we wanted to explain Kant as a response to it. But the problem must be something. Um, so, like along the lines of the person who asked. Doesn't there need to be something that is the subject of perception that is affected by impressions? That the problem would be something along the lines of that it's inconsistent to even talk about this picture and say, like, the impressions that I used to have, um, now I remember them, unless I really do believe that there's such a thing as personal identity. Something like that. Um... Now, I mean, it is true that in a way, but obviously, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but not in the way of saying, oh, yeah, we have some impression that continues throughout our lives. But in a way, that is, you know, where, where Kant will get back to from this, that we can't consistency, consistently doubt our own identity in a certain respect. It's not the identity of a substance, but... It's the transcendental identity of apperception, whatever that is. So, um, but anyway, um, um, uh, but now, I mean, I think actually Hume says pretty clearly what the problem is. And at least on the surface, it's something sim simpler than that. Um, Right, so it's this is in the appendix and it's on page 400 um, at the end of paragraph 20 of the appendix. But all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive perceptions in our thought or consciousness. I cannot discover any theory which gives me satisfaction on this head. So again, I used to think that was some deep point about self-reference or something like that. But now I think, especially if you read the rest of that paragraph, it's pretty clear what he's saying the problem is. He's saying he doesn't understand what are the relations 
that lead the mind to confuse all these with one thing. Right? What is the relationship that makes it natural for the mind to make that transition? So now I think I understand that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that makes something else really hard to understand, which is what, what's the problem? He already mentioned a lot of those relations in the body of the text. There's resemblance and so on and so forth. Ray, uh, why can't he find the principles that do this? And I'm not sure. I mean, he says it's a labyrinth, but he doesn't give any... Um, he doesn't give any of the steps through the labyrinth, as far as I can tell, right? He just says, all my hopes vanish when I, you know, I cannot discover any theory which gives me satisfaction on this head. And then he goes on to talk about the, you know, the result of not being able to do this. But somewhere in not being able to do this was a kind of labyrinth, right? Like a really complicated problem that the more you think about it, the harder it gets or something like that. Um, now, all I can think of at the moment is, and if this is right, then it would connect to Kant. It has something to do with what makes me take these ideas here as memories that are in a certain order to begin with. I mean, here I am now, I have a whole bunch of ideas. What makes them, cons so like some ideas I don't think of as memories. I think of them as flights of fancy or anticipations, you know, connected to desire, whatever. They're not impressions. They're not things I, I believe are present, but they're, uh, they're not memories either. And they don't necessarily have a time order between each other. Right, if I'm imagining a castle at the, in the air at the same time as I'm imagining a unicorn, uh, there doesn't have to be a sequence. One is before the other. So, um, um, or at least, even if maybe I can't imagine two things at the same time, I don't think Hume thinks that, but let's say that's true. I can't imagine two things at the same time. Uh, I mean, first of all, if that were true, that would, that would really complicate this picture here. The whole idea is that I'm, I'm, I have all these ideas and I'm running through them, right? But anyway, like, still, even like, um, it's still the case that okay, maybe I have to imagine one, the unicorn first, and then the castle, or I can imagine the castle first and then the unicorn. But I'm not, not imagining the castle to be after the unicorn. Right? That is, there may be a time sequence of my images, but I don't have an image of a time sequence. That's not necessary. But for these to count as memories, um, there has to be a specific order they go in, and they all have to be ideas, uh, they have to be copies of ideas or impressions I had before. So, like, if I don't put if I don't put the the first one of those in, these don't have any natural order, and so those relations of resemblance and, and cause and effect and whatever aren't going to be um, aren't going to come out, right? Like, if I just shuffle all my images of the oak tree in a random order, then the the relations of gradual change or whatever is gone. So, what makes me or like what is what does it amount to, to think that all these things already happen to me in a certain order? And I think, you know, that's where Hume gets into a labyrinth, because that's where it seems like I must, isn't that imagining that they have a certain relation to my continuing self? Okay, and again, if, if, if that were true, then it would have a lot to do with uh, Kant's attempts to prove that there must be a permanent thing given in experience somehow and things like that. But um, 
Um, that's all I have to say about it. Are there questions about that before I go on to section seven? Okay, so I'm gonna erase this. So section seven, which the title of which is conclusion of this book. The title doesn't really say what it's about. What is it about? Um, well, um, so it's it contains um, an elaborate dramatic fiction. Um, Now, Hume's writing often contains this kind of fiction in a scattered or like temporary, like at a certain place. Um, I don't remember if I had occasion to print, point this out or not in, in Hume before in this course. The most striking example of it is, is in the second inquiry that, that we're not reading. But, you know, he'll say something like, but I had almost forgotten, blah, blah, blah. Right, you know, he starts saying one thing and he says, but wait, what am I saying? I almost forgotten that uh, X, Y, and Z. Now, uh, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this also reminds me, this reminds me of a, of a Monty Python thing, which is probably, Beavis and Butthead is probably beyond your horizon of memory too. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> that there's like a scene in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they're, they find an inscription that says, beware of the terrible beast of, ah, <laughs> and, and the question is like, uh, what happened, you know, like, so like at first you might think that the person was carving the inscription, beware of the terrible beast of, and then the beast came and attacked them. And so they said, ah, right. But then someone points out like, well, uh, he wouldn't have inscribed he, he, R. He would have just said R, right? Like, so um, then someone else says, "Well, perhaps he was dictating." <laughs> Which, but in any case, uh, so going back to Hume, right? Like, if he suddenly was writing something and he forgot that he shouldn't be writing that because of something else, then what he would do is not write in his manuscript, send to the printer, correct and whatever, and publish uh, a thing that said the wrong thing and then said, oh, but I forgot. He would just erase the wrong thing and write the right thing, right? So, oh, but I forgot is, that's why I'm saying it's a dramatic fiction, right? There's like a Hume character. There's like a Hume narrator who we're, so to speak, listening in on, or it's as if he's talking to us. But it's, it's fictional. He's not talking to us. He's dead, right? <laughs> so, um, um, but in section seven, the, the conclusion of book one, um, the, um, the fiction is extended. There's a whole little story about the different moods he's going through. And, you know, I mean, he could have said something like, um, and in a few places, he does say something like this. He could have said something like, you know, in the past, when I thought about these things, I sometimes fell into this mood, but then later I was in this mood. But that's not how it's written. It's like, in my present mood, I feel like I can't, you know, say anything about this. And then later he says, in my present mood, I want to throw all my books into the fire. <laughs> right? So, um, so uh, it's... You know, it's basically, it's very similar to Descartes' Meditations, which has the same character to it. We're listening to a character who, they don't have their own name. In, in some sense, it is Descartes, even though sometimes when I talk about the meditations, I like to call the meditator she, um, both to, I don't know, suggest to remind you that it's not Descartes and to remind you that the one intended reader could be Princess Elizabeth. 
Um, so, uh, I mean, chronologically, that can't literally be right. I, he didn't know Princess Elizabeth until after he wrote the meditations, but uh, that the person who's going through this meditation need not be like Descartes in relevant ways or, or in various ways in particular could need not be a man. Um, right. So anyway, there's like this Descartes character. Um, there's like this Hume character and it's as if we listen in on their thought. Well, in Descartes case, it's as if we listen in on their thought process. But in Hume's case, it's not about a thought process. It's about a sequence of moods. Of um, now my camera's out of focus again. Come back. Shouldn't this camera have like a button on it where you press it and it refocuses? But if it does, I've never located it. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, um, a sequence of actually, it's a sequence of what he calls um, humors. Now, um, so this is an allusion to Galenic medicine. Um, Right, there's supposed to be four humors uh, that uh, that all the tissues and organs, at least as we with the terms we would use of the human body, are all composed somehow out of combinations of these four humors. The four humors are uh, black bile, yellow bile blood and phlegm. So, um, and when the humors are in their proper mixture or temperament, um, right? So temperament, also temperature, originally meant mixture. Um, when they're in the in the right when they're mixed in the right proportions, temperature meant mixture because the what we think of as the temperature of the air was supposed to be due to the admixture of other elements with the air basically. Um, so uh, so when in the right mixture you're healthy and but when they are in the wrong mixture that at least is one of the causes of disease. The main cause of disease, I guess. It's, it's a little more complicated, but or it's super complicated. But anyway, and um, it's not true. Uh, you know, there really is no such thing as black bile. <laughs> um, anyway, like the body's not composed of four humors, and yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, disease is caused by germs. And, <laughs> Yeah, so like it's it's not true, but um, and I don't think Hume thinks it's true. Uh, although I'm not sure what he does think is true. Not necessarily very mu anything very much like what we think is true. But anyway, it's like it's an ancient metaphor, even if you don't take it literally. And I guess so. More particularly if the humors are in the wrong mixture in your brain, then that causes what we would call mental illness. So, um, right, because although Aristotle thought that this, the, the organ of the soul, of you know, perception, imagination, and passion, or whatever was the heart, um, Galen discovered that it was the brain. Uh, so, um, because they, they, they observed people who had brain injuries and, uh, you know, that's basically how they, they first discovered that. So anyway, um, so if these are in the wrong mixture in your brain, that it is then, I mean, so first of all, like everyone, I shouldn't get into this too much. It's only five minutes left. If then the wrong mixture in your brain, it would cause mental illness. And... So, uh, in particular, if 
No. Melancholy means this part means black, and this part means bile. <laughs> I, melancholy is when black bile predominates. Um, uh, when, um, a, a temperament where yellow bile is too melancholic, but it's choleric, where yellow bile is too predominant, um, tends to make you angry. Um, and, you know, if it's too much out of proportion to the point where it's a, like a mental illness. Um, and uh, blood tends to make you sanguine. Confidence, and again, if it's too much, I guess you would be like overconfident. And phlegm tends to make you phlegmatic, which means like kind of um, lazy, dull, cautious, something like that. So Hume goes through this story, and he says that. Um, um, there's, there's three stages of the story. The first one is the stage of melancholy and delirium. The second stage is the stage of spleen and indolence. So spleen, they used to think that yellow bile is produced in the spleen. So splenetic is another word for choleric. Spleen and indolence. And the third stage is the stage of serious good humor. And I f I'm not sure, but I feel like based on a kind of parallel text in the inquiry, I'm not sure if this just means the right mixture or if this, in this case, the blood is predominating. But I think it's this actually. This is the stage of sanguine hopes. So what the what happens to the Hume character in this section is um, that he, or I guess again here I could say she, but why do I feel like that's the right thing to do for the meditator, but not for Hume? Maybe just because it's no, why is it? I think I know why. Let me, let me let me say it for a second, just what happens here. I only have like two minutes left. Um, this stage of melancholy and delirium is the stage at when we reach the end of book one. And, um, and you know, Hume says, it's one of these instances, he says, but what have I just been saying that these strained philosophical reflections have little influence on our life? Right now, I feel the opposite. I feel like I'm separated from all people. I can't, um, like, deformed. Uh, I can't, well, sorry, no, I see them as deformed, so I can't stand to unite myself with them. And yet when I call others to come join me, they're not interested because they see how miserable I am and my doubts and whatever. Um, and... Uh, um, and I have no way out of this mood, right? So it turns out these philosophical reflections did have a strong effect, and it was a bad one. So he says, what's the solution for this? Reason has no solution to it. Reason was what caused the problem. He says, well, there isn't a solution exactly, but after a while, you know, I, I dine, I play a game of black gammon, I converse with my friends, whatever. I stop thinking about this stuff. And um, um, when I turn back to it again, then these are the two parts. I feel indolent, 
It feels cold, strained, and ridiculous, as he puts it. That's also what Descartes' character says in the Sixth Meditation. My doubts of the last few days now seem worthy of ridicule. Um, it's in some, in some sense, and maybe on purpose, this is actually very close to Descartes. So I feel like those reflections were cold, strained, and ridiculous. I'm not tempted to go into them again, but I, but I do remember enough how annoying they were or how, how, what a state they reduced me to that I'm angry at the whole concept of abstruse philosophical speculations. And that's where he says, I want to throw my books and papers into the fire. So again, so what's the solution to this? How does philosophy come back and reassert itself? And in the context of the treatise, this is kind of suspenseful because we need to get to the second book, <laughs> right? The first book is finished. We need to get to the second book. How are we going to do it if Hume wants to throw all his books and papers into the fire? He says, well, again, philosophy doesn't really have anything to say here. All it has to do is wait until my mood changes again. Eventually, after a while, I'll get tired of playing backgammon and whatever, and I'll be like, you know, I feel like going into my study and reading some more philosophy books. <laughs> and then I become sanguine. I start to hope I'll have more success in this new endeavor. Not doing the same stuff over again, but going on to book two and book three. Um, even though it seems like kind of a foolish thing after the shipwreck I ended up in at the end of book one, after, eventually I forget that and I set off again. And Hume says, and that's the right way to do it. Don't let your philosophical doubts prevent you from doing something if you like to do it. <laughs> um, he says, that's the true moderate skepticism. Um, okay, I obviously, I don't have time. Maybe I'll try to say something at the beginning. No, I shouldn't. There's so much to talk about next time. All right, I won't have a time, time to say anything more about the comparison with Descartes, but it's two minutes over. So next time we're talking about the dialogues concerning natural religion. And I will see you then. Bye.